tipping has gone crazy. Now we are tipping for things that we never used to tip for. We are too far into this tipping experiment with uh, with restaurants that we can't just like pull out right now. And if it's so hard to be profitable, then it's only gonna incentivize the owners to pay as little to their workers as possible. One that I'm actually very fascinated about hearing your opinion on is what you think about profit sharing. I think that like whatever changes need to be made, I think need to be made industry wide so that there is no like, oh, well, I'm just going to go to this other place. And... Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Stick. And today we have something a little bit different for you guys. We do not have a guest, but we really wanted to tackle a really important and pressing issue within the bar industry. And that is tipping. We talked about the origins of tipping, the implications of tipping, whether we think it's a good idea, it's a bad idea. Uh, and really got into a lot of the nuance about tipping culture in America. And, and we even try to provide some alternative solutions at the end. If you're enjoying this episode, leave us your comments down below wherever it is that you are consuming this content. We would love to hear your thoughts, especially on this topic, because I think that this is the kind of thing that requires a lot of voices to be heard on it. But I think we had an incredible discussion today and uh, enough rambling for me. Let's get right into it. <laughs> Yeah, so today, today, we are going to talk about tipping. Tipping, Leandro. Uh, this is a little bit different than what we our episodes have been, yep. but I we think, at least I think, this will be a very fascinating conversation because it's such a prominent part of the industry, oh. and it's become, you know, it's every single place you go to in America, it's the standard, right? And so many people make a living off of tips, uh, both as servers and bartenders, and, and and it's such an integral part of the hospitality industry here in this country that I think it'd be a good time to talk about our thoughts about it. But before we get to what we think, I think it's important to talk about like kind of where it came from. So I did some research, uh, not so in depth, but one of the sources that I found, it was basically saying that Tipping was a custom that was brought back from by, by like wealthy Americans in like the middle of the 1800s, like the 1850s, as they were like traveling in Europe and coming back to the states. Uh, as a like, it kind of started out as like a, a way to um, like give your peasant servants like a little bit extra for some good work that they did. Right. Uh, and it was a really weird kind of like it was kind of like here you go, boy, good job. Here's a treat for you, and then right. it kind of developed from there. It actually goes back, um, for, and it, some people it goes back further. It's like the, like everybody oh, yeah? likes to talk about the racial aspect of it because in America there was a, mm -hmm. like a it was cut tied to the end of slavery, but it actually started in the medieval ages when kings and queens would give a little extra money to their servants for doing a good job. So it, it's like the origin of it is super problematic to begin with because it's like a it's like a, it's already putting the people receiving the hospitality on a pedestal above the person that is giving the hospitality and and i don't think that that dynamic has ever gone away no and i and, and when i started reading into that as well i found that to be probably one of the weirdest parts about it because it definitely creates that separation of you know you're you know you have your the it still continues right like the rich aristocrats or the people with money and then the people below them and then it's like they're that you always hold those two people in position with this process uh which is really crazy to think about because when i was a server in like my early part of my career like i never thought about this it was just like oh yeah it's super normal like this is all like you know, this is just how we do things in America. Um, but it's it, like you said, it's very it's it, even, even if whether you look at it from the uh, the medieval origins or even its ties to uh, like reconstruction post slavery, like right. both of those are still very problematic, super problematic. And then like, you know, literally during slavery, there would be a lot of I mean, at, not during slavery, but at the end of slavery, when slavery was ended, there would be a lot of African-American people going into hospitality because it was one of the only jobs that they were really able to get because it was one of the, the jobs that not many people wanted to do. And so they would do this job and then mm -hmm. they would work and a lot of owners didn't want to pay them because they were still looked at like as like a lower person. And so um, if, if a person at all, 
And so tipping became a way for them to like really solely make money. And so that's also insanely problematic. Um, you know, so a lot of people, you know, when they're arguing against tipping, they're talking about like the origins of it being so problematic. But how do you as a bar owner feel about tipping? That's a that's a great question. And I guess it's a really good point, you know, a good starting point, because uh, I I actually think that tipping is, is great. And the reason why I'm very pro tipping is just because, you know, when I was a bar manager uh, and I was working in bars earlier in my career, like everybody in my family would always be like, oh, like when are you going to get a real job? And it was this, you know, I'm sure everybody who's worked in the industry long enough, like you hear that from some family member or someone at some point, right? Like I've had bar guests look at me and be like, oh, like what's your real job, you know? Right. And at the time I was making, I had a college degree. I was, you know, college educated, but my only options with a business degree, because everybody has one, like unless you knew someone in a really high up, uh, company or something like I, I applied to a ton of jobs. Right. I got a interview at a Hertz rental dealership to be a manager there to make $35,000 a year. So I'd have to work, you know, crazy hours all year long to make $35,000. Or I, what, which, which is what I ended up doing was continuing bartending. And just, I made three times that in a year. Right. And so that wouldn't be possible without tipping. So this is maybe I'm answering this more as like a back when I was a bartender mm -hmm. kind of thing, not even as a bar owner quite yet. But I mean, I think that's an important aspect to begin with because I don't think, while I can see it being problematic in the sense of like, obviously there's a separation of class, right? And and I feel like mm -hmm. I've, I've felt it, especially working in, you know, I worked in, in a, <laughs> In a, in a pretty affluent city nearby. Um, you know, uh, you, you're from Cambridge, so I don't know if you're ever, like, you know, Wellesley. Oh, yeah. So Wellesley, very affluent. So like, I worked there for, for quite a while and it was um, a very, it was very clear that the people who attended the bar that I worked yeah. at were, uh, they felt, they saw themselves much higher and above the people who worked there. Oh, of course. And it was just something that we ended up just accepting. But at the same time, the tip, the tips was what allowed me to uh, actually make this a living because, you know, federally, I'm pretty sure that minimum wage for tipped workers is still $3 and 36 no, cents. No, I, think, no, I know in Massachusetts, no, 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 it's no, no. now, it's a state law. Those are state laws. So in California, right. So I'm saying that there, but there's a minimum. Yeah, no, but yeah, there's a minimum, which, which I think actually they're doing away with in, I, I believe that Massachusetts is doing away with it. And I actually, I, I don't want to like break it gone quite up. yet, but I do have a point. On, I want to come back to that because I do have a point about that specific thing making like the, the, the certain states that make it a very low minimum wage compared to non-tipped workers. But but please go ahead yep. if you're if you're sorry. I didn't want to break in. No, no, absolutely. Um, you know, my whole point was that like you know, federally speaking, the minimum is three dollars and something. But if like you said, every state has its own. Uh, they set their own rate. So like in Massachusetts, it's finally gone up for the, I think the first time in like 60 something years to almost like seven, I think it's like $6 and 15 cents. Yeah. What, um, and it's supposed to go up to $7 by next year. And it's supposed to kind of keep, keep going, going up, up from there. Right. So like here in, in, in LA, right in Los Angeles County, it's 12 bucks an hour. Wow. And in West Hollywood, it's $19 an hour minimum wage. Interesting. So it's, it's even by county. By, it's not well, just city, like by city. West, West Hollywood is a different city. So, I see. Yeah, they, they like West yeah. Hollywood famously seceded from LA. So they're no longer LA. They're West Hollywood and Beverly Hills is his own city as well. I see. So they get to set their minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not just like a state law. I mean, this, I think the state law minimum is 12, like the, like the, the state law minimum in California is 12, but cities can make it higher mm -hmm. if they want to. Um, it, it, this is awesome oh, wow. too, because I'm completely like, I, I also worked for tips for a very long time and I'm completely against tipping. Yep. Um, uh, mm. and I think that now I want to spend this hour just convincing you against tipping. I, I understand though, because I made a lot of money as a bartender, but here's my question to you. All right. How do you reconcile the lack of tips for the back of house? Because that's where things get like kind of complicated, you know? So funnily enough, I actually sat with my wife and we were having a whole conversation about this because I do believe that there is a problem of, of equity in restaurants uh -huh. because the servers aren't the only one who provide the service, right? So in restaurants, what I always tell my staff is we don't sell food, we sell an experience. And if you sell an experience, then it's not, it's not just about one aspect of it. It's about everything that encompasses it, meaning the kitchen staff as well. So, right. um, 
I have been trying to find a way to change that in my own restaurant and, and for any future projects of how do you make it more equitable for your kitchen staff, right? And unfortunately, I have not really found a solution that I think is really fair across the board because let's analyze it, right? Like on the one hand, if you were to, um, you know, reduce the amount of tips that the front of house get, you might actually lose out on talent because someone like maybe your best bartender who really makes an impact to right. your experience is like, well, I could, I could work for you or I could go to the other guy next door and make, you know, double or triple because he's not splitting my tips with the back of house. And so how do I reconcile that with back of house? I, 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 I don't, and I don't know how, I'm not really sure what the, what the proper uh, solution would be. I'm very yeah. invested in trying to find out what the solution would be because I think to really what you're illustrating here is the fact that it isn't equitable for everybody within a restaurant, no, right? it's not. Um, because as of, yeah, I and mean, as of and, right and, now, and only and front and of even house. The tipping schedule when it comes to even just front of the house, you know, like you've got bussers and you got bar backs, you know. Some, some, some bars don't have bar backs, but uh, for the most part, the structure is you've got the bartender, the bar back, you've got a ser- you got servers, you've got bussers, right? Typically, the bar, the, the bartenders have to tip out wait staff and bar and bar backs, bar backs. When I was bartending, got 20% of both tills. However many bartenders, every bartender would have to give the bar backs 20%. But if there's two bar backs on staff, that means they're only getting 20% from one bartender the other bar backs getting 20% or, or if there's only one bar back, then they're getting, you know, 20% off each till. Then you've got, I can't remember what it was. I think it was like 15%, 12 to 15% for the, for the waiters. But I think it was like 12 to 15% of service tickets. I believe they only took a service to, and then they have to tip out their, their bussers. And I feel like bar backs and bussers do so much hard work that, 20% 20% yeah. is a slap in the face. I even used to give them 30% and I thought that it was too low, you know? So that's like a very, yeah. you know, and then they always say, well, well, the bar back is the entry level position to becoming a bartender and you eat crap for a while. You eat your crud, you pay your dues, and then you're, you're, um, you're rewarded with being a bartender. But I've also had many bar backs that had absolutely no aspirations to be a bartender, whether they made money or not. And so for those people, yeah. that's not a really good incentive, right? But I'm going to lay no, out a few points of why they just want to be paid a fair wage. Problematic, having nothing to do with like you know legacies of, of slavery, which I think that in the bar world and in the cocktail world, even when we're talking about history of cocktails, we really turn a blind eye and not mention the kind of legacy of slavery that you know kind of runs through this country and all of our history. But which is problematic and should yeah. be talked about more. But a, it's it's like it's hard. It's almost impossible, like you said, to make it like completely egalitarian, right? Between all of the positions, and then there are people that lose out, yep. right? B, it creates a it creates a atmosphere. Bet- it creates a relationship, not an atmosphere. That's this wrong word. It creates a relationship between the customer and the server or bartender that puts the bartender on a lower tier because you are then working for their tip for your tip. And so therefore it gives an incentive to customers to be problematic, to be irrational, to be not logical and to basically think that they can do whatever they want because they're holding your tip hostage, right? Until the end of their, you know, and they can really demand some pretty outlandish things, right? I also think, and this is where I hope this doesn't piss you off, but I also think that it's a really sly way for bar owners, all right, to not have to pay their staff a living wage. So you say, oh, well, I can pay you $4 an hour or whatever the minimum wage is because I, you get these tips. And the thing is, is that that type of thinking basically says without saying, saying it out loud that this job is a subservient job that people do while they're trying to do more more interesting and important things in their lives. And 
it's basically saying without saying it out loud that this is a subservient job that doesn't deserve to get paid as much as a lawyer or a doctor or more important positions. And so therefore, we're not going to pay you what you think you're worth or what you are worth. Even though you're an integral part of my restaurant, we're going to pay you but we're going to pay you low because you get tips so that we can limit the amount of money you can make, which I think is also super problematic. Mm. It is. And, and you're, you know, you're spot on because it does create that. You know, I think that, and even within certain restaurants that I've worked in, when you, another aspect of this that I don't think we even touched upon yet is like, in, in, in any business, you have a team and you need people to work together. You need people to be, you know, all kind of rowing in the same direction and you need everybody kind of be on the same page, right? right. Like if you, if your restaurant and bars uh, idea is to make sure that you're providing a certain type of service, then mm-hmm. you need everybody kind of on the same, you know, singing from the same hymn sheet. You need everybody to kind of be on the same page. If you have people making, you know, only working for tips and only individual tips, you're not, like I've worked in places and, and you, there's no teamwork. Everybody is. I'm gonna do my side work. I'm gonna do my work. Right. I'm gonna t- tend to my guests, and I'm done. And like, I'm not doing anything yeah. else. So, and that's it. So to combat that in my in my restaurant, we pool tips. So the bartenders pool, servers on the floor pool. So that way, you know, everybody's tips is part of you know it's everybody's tip. Um, it means that it, it sure it means that maybe you can give stellar service to one person and maybe you'd miss out on like a huge tip mm-hmm. but it also means that on like super slow days when maybe you would get no tips at least you're not going to leave empty yeah do you do like a point system so like if someone gets cut early there's like a point system so that like this many person gets this point and the, but they left at eight so they get this many points and then you divvy it up that way we do it by hours worked okay so if you we pool throughout hours worked so then i, I will take the entire pool divide it by however many total hours worked by everybody. And then uh, we'll get an, a, a tip per hour amount and then multiply the yeah, hours right. worked That's by everybody like by that amount. And then that way it's at least fair. Right. And like someone who, like if you, like we have, we're open on lunches for Saturdays. Some days they're super busy. Some days they're dead. Right. right? Because not everybody wants to really go out to lunch. Right. So uh, it's just a way of making sure that like, I have to staff that, that day. Right. I have to staff that shift. And if people think that they're going to make, you know, 20 bucks, they're not going to come to work. So we pulled the whole day as a way of like every, and people rotate who works the lunch shift. Cause in that way, it's just more fair to everybody mm-hmm. across the board. We have, and the thing is it works for me because we have a small staff. So we only have, you know, uh, I think at this point I have four servers, uh, and one who, one of whom is an assistant manager to my manager. Mm-hmm. I have two bartenders and that's it. So it's like a small crew and it actually works Wait, two out. Two bartenders of course, and that you isn't, or um, just two bartenders, including you? Two bartenders, I fill in when, you, when necessary. When to, right. um, I will cover, I'll cover shifts if I have to. I'm usually here, but most of the time I have the two bartenders and then uh, four on the floor um, and one host. And the host actually helps running food and busing tables because it's just a small spot. Yeah, so yeah. it works out. So it, like, but I can, it, but, it, but I've had food runners in the past and it ended up actually being worse for everybody because they were upset that they were dividing their tips with one extra person. So it's by pooling tips, I've actually been able to get my staff all on the same page, at least front of house, but that doesn't really address any of the other issues that you've, you've uh, very expertly uh, laid out, which is that issue of the guest being like, you know, treating you in a, in a way where they, like they quote unquote own you, right? Where they're like, oh, I'm paying for your bills. Like I've had guests say that to me. And while that is, you know, I think that it's minimized by pooling tips because then it's like, well, if this dude doesn't give me a tip, it's not that big of a deal because it's going to be, you know, pooled. Right. right. Um, but of course, someone could look at this and go, there's also a negative to it because you have some people on staff who can just coast by because they don't have to work so hard. Right. Right. So. Right. But then I think that's when management needs to then step in and go, oh, you're not pulling your weight. You're out. Yeah. Right. Which is what we've had to do. We've had that problem, too, where people aren't pulling their weight. And if you're and if you're if you're getting your own tips. Right. If you're keeping your own tips, then like out of your till, then then it incentivizes you to pull your weight. Although I think at, at Kohl's, what we did is we mm-hmm. pooled tips from the bar. Like the entire restaurant didn't pool. Yeah. We just the bar pooled and the and the the servers pooled. But what's crazy is that in California, it is completely illegal for a restaurant or bar to manipulate tips at all or have anything to do with them. 
unless the staff agrees to it, right? Because the problem with restaurant, like pooling tips and then you taking your tips and turning it into a manager is that nobody knows how much tips were made through that day. And there's a lot of managers out there that will just skim a couple hundred bucks off the top for the week before the tip out goes out. And then they put the tip on your check and taxes are taken out. And it's almost impossible, if not impossible, to correctly calculate how much money was brought in. And so it... It, there's like a theft problem, you know, it, it, it leaves, it's vulnerable to theft, um, which does happen quite a 100%. bit in, in the, in, in the bar industry. So it's like, it's also problematic. So like at Kohl's, we did our, we pulled our tips for the shift and then we counted out our tips. Mm-hmm. We put our tills back to, you know, whatever the till started at, took our tips and then split it and tipped everyone out that like per shift. So that like management had absolutely nothing to do with the right. tips at all. Yeah. Which, which to your point, like I've worked in places where I've had people accuse management of, of doing that because they would just, things just wouldn't add up. Like you'd be like, how did I make exactly this round number for that shift? Like why, why is it always just like a round number? And obviously we were much busier than that. So, um, I'm, I've always been very transparent with my staff. I have a very, we have a very transparent system. I'm not going to get into it. It's just like Excel sheets and, and no, yeah, yeah. We don't basically have to like the details or anything. I, it's like, <laughs> but it's like, you know, I'm, I always tell all of my staff, I'm like, like, I'll sit you down and I'll show you exactly how everything gets done. We have a report that goes out with everybody's tips so that they know that I'm not, you know, taking any money because that you're right. And it can happen. Right. And I think that the only reason we're able to do it the way that we do it now is because we have a small crew. And it's very tight knit. If it weren't, I don't know. Like you said, if I like if I had a manager I didn't trust, then I can totally see that being a huge issue. Where it's like, well, what are what what are they doing? You know, like. But um, which is a huge. It's it's a very fair point because there are restaurants that do have uh-huh. wage theft, and when we hear about it, you know, on on the internet all the time. Um, and so, you know, obviously from from a, you know, to finally come back around to your question mm-hmm. about as a, cause I've, I've talked a lot about this as a, you know, a bartender, but not really as a bar owner, but the way that I think that tipping is actually beneficial to, you know, small mom and pop restaurants mm-hmm. is that, you know, the margins in this industry are absolutely brutal. You know, like if you look at any, like you can do any research, talk about like, you know, uh, profit margins in restaurants. If you're running a restaurant well, at most you can hope for is anywhere between five and 15% of profit right, right. a year right? Like you're moving through tons of, of, you know, you may have a lot of like revenue, but your expenses are through the roof. You know, like the cost of food has gone up considerably over the last couple of years. Um, you know, the here in Massachusetts, the real estate has been absurd. So you have these price hikes that start happening out of nowhere. You've had, we had, there's a bunch of restaurants that ended up closing, you know, over the last several years, obviously there was the whole pandemic thing happening and, and, and that really put a strain on the industry. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, what, What's happening in Massachusetts is that most, you know, towns and cities, they just have a lot of chain restaurants because they're the only ones who can really, like, really uh, fathom going through this process. Uh, It's very hard for you to get, like, an owner-operator place that is around for a very long time because these margins are brutal. So now I'm not saying this is right because obviously I think that people need to make a living wage and I've been really scratching my head about how to make this happen. Uh Like from the very first day that I opened a restaurant, it's been my, my one goal to figure it out. Um, but we, it's just, it's such a difficult thing because the profit margins are so tiny. So it is a way of helping out a small owner of being able to be like, our, one of your biggest expenses is your payroll as, as a restaurant owner. It's, it's yes. Cost of goods is a huge one, but your biggest one is your payroll. Um, labor people is the biggest one. So, well, yeah, not to mention, because if you're slow that day, you're still paying out labor and you're paying out labor for the same staff, whether you make a lot of money or not. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, just to, I I just want to go back to this real quick before we move on because then it'll be lost. But I think as a chain restaurant, I think it's easier to have better margins because when you are a powerful corporation, you can, I'm not sure if you can like determine how much you pay for goods, but you can definitely like, if you're buying in bulk, you can definitely like the more you buy, 
the 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 lower the cost is going to be per good, right? You know, same way as like if you buy a thousand stickers yeah, and you at can, one, game, but if you buy five thousand stickers, it's going to be you know a dollar fifty less per per sticker or something. You know, it's kind of the I think I, I imagine it's the same way. So so you know TGI Fridays or Chili's or something is going to have an easier time staying in business because they have a massive company as opposed to a small mom and pop place that is actually working on very thin margins. Absolutely. And, and, and it's economies of scale at that point because they can distribute that amount of stuff that they buy to all the other different locations. Right. So like, OK, cool. You have you know, you, you can get a great deal on having like and that's something that even my restaurant, we have no basement. We have no storage space, like all the bottles behind me. Like this is pretty much my alcohol, uh, you know, storage. I have a couple of shelves over here and then like some in my back right. shed. But like I can't. For example, I used to work for, I used to work for a guy who I'm and I'm not joking. He one time like he we, his he had a prep kitchen in the basement and he had three different rooms for alcohol. And one time I, I was this was when I was a bar manager. I showed up to work one day and he literally bought like 500 cases of High West whiskey. And like I had to sort through 500 cases to make sure that they were all separated out, but he got a huge deal on it. And he, and we we went through that High West for, you know, throughout the course of a year, but right. he got a huge deal right, on it right. because the case drop on it of being able to order 500 cases, he had the space for it. So, um, you know, Obviously, a chain restaurant or a larger corporation will be able to do that on a larger mm -hmm. scale because there's more locations, there's more ways of splitting it up. And so there are certain ways. And so this this is all in, 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 in a way to kind of illustrate that there are, you know, small restaurants that are owned by people who are just really trying to make a living. Um, but it, it's tough, you know, like uh, it's just hard because it's such a difficult industry to be in. And I was talking to my former boss a couple of years ago and it was like, or like a year ago, he was like, only crazy people get in this industry. Right. Like only lunatics will want to open a restaurant given how insane everything is. Now I'm not, and I hope this doesn't come across as me saying like, this is how we need to keep things because I don't think that's true. I think that there does need to be change. And I'm really like, even I'm looking inward on my, on my own behalf of how to right. bring that about. You know, one of the ways that we do it is my, my bartenders do not get paid minimum wage, minimum tip wage. So my bartenders get paid uh, more hourly than my servers do. Um, so we do pay them more per hour than the other service staff do, um, because I do want to make them at least be like, hey, it's not I wish I could pay you more. But this is kind of what like where I'm maxed out, where right. any of this makes sense. Um, and so, you know, I it's it's rough dude like it's um i'm just now i'm thinking about like you know the city of boston they for you to open a restaurant anywhere in a zip code of boston like you have to buy a liquor license and the cheapest price of a liquor license in boston is six hundred and fifty thousand. so wait a minute then how did you do it though how did you do it i'm not in boston so i'm in i'm in i'm in the suburbs, and in the suburbs so it's easier if you have a so in Massachusetts, they used to have restrictions in every town of how many liquor licenses can be given yeah. out. A lot of towns did away with that because they're trying to encourage people to uh, open places. So where my restaurant is and a couple of places nearby, there's no limits any longer. But in the city of Boston itself, they still have that hard limit. And so I was, again, talking to my former boss who has a, a bar in the suburbs. And he was and people always ask him, they're like, why don't you open something in the city? And he goes, because I want to actually make money. Right. You because can. if you had to front up six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and then on top of it build out a restaurant, which is going to cost you anywhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars, the only people who can do it are these restaurant groups that have the restaurants in Boston. Before you even made a penny. Right. I mean, you're a million dollars in before you even know whether your bar or restaurant is going to be a success. You know, and that's that's yeah. a that's a scary prospect to be a million dollars in in debt on something that you don't know. <laughs> but it, it just also then me, and I know that yeah. this person that I'm about to bring up is kind of problematic these days. But it just also makes me wonder, like how Nancy Silverton, you know, kind of built an empire right in Boston, like in some of the most prime real estate. Is it just because she was around for so long that she was? I don't know. I think that there must be people who have been around for a very long time who got in at the right time. And they've just been strengthening their hold on it. Like the, a couple of years ago, there was supposed to be a vote to allow more liquor licenses to be issued in Boston. Right. Everybody on the city council thing that they had all vetoed it. They all said no. So it's like people are trying to make changes, but it's like it's really difficult. And so what? not to escape too far away outside of the tipping part, but I'm thinking about it. Like imagine if you do go through all of this trouble, you buy this liquor license, you spend all this money to build it out. You're a million in the hole before you made it a, a dollar. How do you justify being like, 
oh, I'll pay my bartenders 20 bucks an hour and, and, you know, tips will get rid of when it's like, well, now all of a sudden labor is your most expensive part. You just spent a million dollars on this thing. You need it. You needed to make some money at some point right. or else you were not sustainable. I mean, I hate to make this a political discussion, although it is kind of a political discussion, but like, it seems to me that the problem, like the root of the problem is just a capitalist society because if it, it, like at the end of the day, right, if you're, if you can, if, if every piece of like every component that makes up a bar from the real estate, the people that hold the real estate to the people that, that sell the goods, right? The, the food that is going to eventually be turned into dishes and sold. If those people can basically just charge whatever they want with absolutely no restriction, then they can make it impossible for a bar or restaurant to be profitable at all. And if it's so hard to be profitable, yep. then it's only going to incentivize the owners to pay as little to their workers as possible. So at the end of the day, it just seems mm -hmm. like like it's the, the root of the problem is the entire capitalist economy that we have in the U.S., right? I mean, the thing is, it's funny people go to they people point to Europe and they say, oh, well, in Europe, there's no tipping. They just, you know, pay their people a living wage. But actually, we had a guy named Neil that used to work at Kohl's with us who was Welsh. And he had a V, he had a green, like a green card or like he had a visa mm -hmm. or something, but he had to spend six months in England or Britain and six months in, and in LA or in or like in LA, but like in the U S to keep his like visa active. Yep. Right. So he had to constantly shift yep. back and forth six months here, six months there. He's basically, you know, bi coastal or whatever. And, and so he, so he like, so we, so Cole's French dip is the front bar and the varnish is the back bar. The varnish uh, comes out of the milk and honey family. Uh, Eric Alper is a guy that worked at Little Branch, you know, worked with Sasha for a long time. And so Neil pulled mm -hmm. some strings and got him to, got Eric Alper to vouch for him so that he could get a job at milk and honey in London. All right. So he went to go work at milk and honey oh, wow. in London for a while. And he said, I, ha I had to quit because... The thing is, is that London is too expensive and although, and you don't make any tips in England, but then on top of that, you don't get paid a living wage either. So you're not getting tips and you're not getting paid a living wage. Yeah. And he's like, at the end of the day, after I paid for like my rent and after I paid for food and just like expenses, I had nothing left. I had nothing left. He's an, like a visual artist and now he's actually a professor at a university in Ohio, I think. Oh, wow. So, and he was actually a very celebrated visual artist. And so he went on to do that. So he's no longer in the bar industry, but I remember him saying that. But then also in a couple of years ago, I went to Italy. Uh, and while tipping is not expected in Italy, tipping is a thing. Like you do tip in Italy. You yeah. just, it's just not expected yeah. as part of the thing. But if you get good service, I mean like tipping for me, you know, since COVID has happened, I, don't, I hope I'm not like pivoting too much, but like since COVID have ha has happened, tipping, tipping has gone crazy. Now we are tipping for things has. that we never used to tip for. So like with the advent of these uh, POS systems like Clover, where they have a little swivel screen yep. where basically you go in to buy, mm -hmm. you know, a soda at a convenience store and then they flip it around and it asks for a tip. And then you feel like I got a tip, even though I'm just buying something at a store and I'm not really getting any service per se. Um, mm hmm you know, mm -hmm. for me, I think that if tipping exists, it's not, it's not a, it's not a requirement of the job. So for instance, I've seen these viral videos of this like pizza hut delivery guy freaking out because he's delivering the pizza and then they didn't tip him on the app. And then he's like, well, I'm just going to take your pizza yeah. back to pizza hut and you can go pick it up yourself because you're not paying me to do my job. And it's like, no, man, right. you don't get tipped just for doing the basic function of your job. You don't get a tip for doing the basic function of your job. You don't just automatically get tipped because you're delivering pizzas. Pizza Hut pays you to deliver pizzas. And if you don't like the amount right. of money that they pay you because it's not paying you a living wage, you can't then demand a tip. There is also, there was this customer that used to come no. to Coles and he used to, we used to talk about tipping a little bit. And he was, used to say, Tipping stands for, and it doesn't quite work out with the letters, but to ensure proper service, right? 
it should be, I mean, insure is yeah. with an E, right? I guess insure with an I would be like you're insuring something, but it kind of works out, right? To insure proper service, meaning like, T tapping. Right, like you get proper service and then you tip because you get proper or above and beyond service, not just like doing the basic function of your job. Yep. And so I feel like this is another way in which tipping has become incredibly problematic because it's like, now I don't know who to tip and who not to tip and why to tip. And it sort of cheapens the whole thing if you're just tipping yep. everybody and it makes everything incredibly expensive. Marius is gonna weigh in here, hold on. Gratuity, right, yeah, that's what he said. He said, so Marius off camera, I don't know if anyone can hear him, but you're not mic'd, right? He's not mic'd, so. He said, it used to, everyone forgot what tipping, that tipping, everyone forgot that tipping used to be called gratuity, right? And then there's like, mm -hmm. what is the definition mm -hmm. of the word gratuity? Being grateful for something, right? You're grateful for this above and beyond yep. service and though you show your gratitude by tipping as opposed to just like, now it's this like built-in thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that what you were describing there about how tipping is now starting to infiltrate other aspects of life is really problematic in and of itself, because I think that actually poses a threat to the service industry the way that it currently exists. Because I think that through everything that we've outlined, we've shown that it's not as clear cut as, hey, pay your staff a living wage, because it isn't. I, w I wish it were. I really, really I do. I wish it were. And, and if, you, if you guys think I just sound like a salty owner of, of a business, then I'm sorry. But it's, it's the truth is that there is, it's like we are too far into this tipping experiment with, uh, with restaurants that we can't just like pull out right now. Like if, if everything just like, just if people stop tipping completely in America, so many, like almost every restaurant would fail at least to a degree. Uh, so many of them would right. fail. Not everyone. I, I I'm like speaking generalizations, but like, you know, it would basically it would crumble this house of cards. And I think that unfortunately the way that this is now starting to infiltrate like there, there's a Starbucks that I, I will I will hit up every so often on my way to work. And it, you know, these drive through coffee joints, like, yeah, there'd be a little tip bucket. And if you had, you know, I'd always tip a, a little bit here or there or whatever. The Starbucks now is that if you pay for a card, they don't take your card. They bring out a little machine. You have to tap it. And then the, fir and the first option is, are you going to tip $1, $3, or $5? My coffee is $8, which is already absurdly expensive. And now, like, the, the little option to hit no tip is all the way at the right. bottom. And it's like you're shamed by the person 100%. working there. And it's yeah. like, don't get me wrong. I work for tips. I understand that, right? And so my my fear is that I think that a lot of these bigger, you know, corporate owners and the people in these corporations and these larger larger institutes are like, how can we find a way to reduce our largest uh, expense, which is labor? Because if we talked about how labor is expensive in restaurants, labor is expensive in every aspect of, of business. It's probably like the number one expense. And so unfortunately, I feel like it's starting to infiltrate other aspects and that could really negatively impact the restaurant industry until unless we find a solution sooner rather than later how do you feel about that you think i'm just be doing doom and gloom no, no i was thinking <laughs> i was just thinking about i was like quiet for a second because i was thinking about starbucks because you know what's interesting is that also the tipping thing with starbucks has been really in the news lately because a lot of Starbucks places have been trying to unionize. And so what Starbucks has been doing mm -hmm. as a corporation is that they have been taking away the they've been taking away the ability to tip for oh, places wow. that have been trying to unionize and only allowing those that are not trying to unionize to be able to be tipped. The other thing is that like I if I get Starbucks, which is, is pretty rare these days, you know, but like sometimes I'll get like a tea from Starbucks. I get it on the app. And what's crazy is that if you if you reload a, car, a Starbucks gift card, it, it gives you the ability to tip. But if you use your credit card, like if you just like have your credit card loaded into the thing, it doesn't even give you an option to tip. That said, it's also very difficult to like, like again, like determine like whether or not you kind of should tip for Starbucks. Because on the one hand, it's like, like I do not think that it's right that you should tip somebody for just the basic function of their job just like just doing the basic function of their job yeah. they should just, like they are getting paid by their own the by the owner of the place they likely could go find another place i don't mind it actually when restaurants will add the gratuity in but this is but i do what i do hate is and there's a couple of restaurants that i do eat at in la 
that do this thing where they say, like on the bottom of the of the receipt that you get, it says, you know, a 5% charge or a 10% charge has been added in lieu of tips, right? So they add it on every transaction, which I'm fine with. But when you go there to order, they will still flip the screen around and it will ask you for a tip. And so therefore you're double tipping. Interesting. Yeah, you're, you're paying higher price in food to account for that. But then they're still asking for a tip from the POS system because that's the, the way the POS system works. Although I'm sure you could customize it to not do that. And that to me is really disingenuous because yeah. you're basically like, unless people know what they're doing, you like, oh, of course I'm going to tip for my food. And then you tip and then you also have like get just get informed if you read your your receipt that you've that you've already paid in a higher price for tips as well and so you're basically double right. t- tipping and to me that's completely disingenuous i think that that's a terrible like when 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 restaurants do that honestly no i was gonna say because i think that you know we've kind of i feel like we've covered a lot of the reasons of why tipping is good why it's bad why it's not as clear cut I think that maybe as a, as a way to kind of round this out would be to talk about alternatives, right? And I think you were just touching upon one of them because I remember a couple of years ago, I was reading an article, I forget what publication it was in. It was some food, it, it might've been Punch. It might've been one of these like bartending food industry blogs. I can't remember which one it was, but it was basically hyping up a restaurant in Silicon Valley or like in the, in the Bay Area that they, you know, they got rid of tipping and they put in, you know, a surcharge where they're they're paying everybody the, a fair wage, but then there's a surcharge to be able to like pay the kitchen staff. Like, do you think that that's actually a val a valid uh, way? Because I think that one of the things that you were just alluding to is that some restaurants may have that, but then they might still still ask you for a tip on top right. of it. Yeah, I think that they need to be super overt. Like, I mean, I've been to restaurants where they tell you, hey, by the way, like there's a, a, a place called Great White that I eat at, you know, it's just kind of nice comfort food from kind of all over the world. They do a really good job. I like eating there. I've been there a lot recently. And they say like, oh, just so you know, gratuity has been added. They'll tell you that before they give you the thing. And then if you want to add, you know, we usually tip on top anyway. Like I usually tip like 30% on top of the gratuity that has been added. You know, we've been going there for like, I don't know, my daughter's birthday and with large parties. And they've been like super on the spot. They gave us like a private room and everything. And so, of course, I want to tip higher. And usually if I get good service, like there's no limit to how I, 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 I have been... I have been known to tip 50% sometimes if I get really good service, right? Because yeah. I've been in the service industry 100%. and I, I I think that, you know, I think that when I, I want to reward good service, right? Because then, I don't, for me, tipping, yeah. t- tipping, this is what I've always told people. Like for me, tipping is like buying insurance, right? Like you go to hmm. your favorite spot and you take care of the people that are there. If you take care of the people that are there, they will give you priority. You walk into the bar and they know that you tip really well, you're getting served first. You don't even need to worry about it. Like you, they know that you tip really well right. and you're a regular there, you're getting the best seat in the house. They're, they'll save you a table or they'll put you where you want to sit. They'll move things around for you because they know that you are you have a reciprocal relationship with them. So to me, it's like buying, it's like buying, it's like, right. especially at my favorite spots, it's like tip well, that's like buying, that's like buying insurance. And then also, if you go there and you get bad service and you don't tip well, then it makes a bigger statement when you usually tip well and then you're not because then they say, what's going on? Right. And they kind of look inwardly at their service. Mm-hmm. Um, right. I think I got a little off track off like what your main point was. I no, think no, that you're like, good. My, 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 but- I think the addition of a 20% charge is, or, or making your f- prices reflect a 20% upgrade and then tipping out your staff later does take care of a lot of problems. Like for instance, it definitely, if you get rid of tipping altogether and you just make your prices reflect a 20% upgrade and give that 20% to the entire staff, then it gets rid of, it gets rid of a lot of like, first of all, with tipping, it's, it's up and down because not everybody tips on every check, right? So if you are taking 20% on every single transaction, then you have enough to probably tip out your back of house. Your front of house is still making enough money. And then also you get rid of that dynamic where people are like, oh, well, you're working for your tip and you're, and I'm going to work you, you know, kind of a thing. That dynamic between the customer and the server or bartender. I think that it is, I think you hit on a lot of really great points about why something like that is a good, uh, 
why that could be a good alternative to tipping. Uh, the one thing that I think ends up happening is that uh, I think a lot of people are very money conscious. Obviously, everyone's always money conscious of like, especially but especially in tougher times, someone might look at that and go, oh, what's this 20% at the bottom here? So I think either you have to just hide it into your menu item price. So that way it doesn't yeah, look like I, a I, surcharge like, yeah, where it's just upgrade. like your your steak just happens to. It's like if you have a, like, I know, like, first of all, prices since COVID have been crazy. But if you have a $16 salad, if you have a yeah. $16 salad, and mm -hmm. you up if you just raise the price twenty percent, it's gonna make a twenty dollars salad, mm -hmm. which is an expensive salad. But if you don't yeah. ask for a tip at the end, if you give them no way to tip, people will go for it. Mm -hmm. And you can even say, like, listen, we've raised right. our prices twenty percent. That twenty percent goes directly to the staff. You don't need to tip. We're not gonna give you an option. Mm -hmm. You you don't have to tip. People will go for it because they're paying that. Yeah regard they're first of all they're paying that fee anyway and secondly even if you don't give people a, a way to tip on their card if somebody really wants to tip more they will they will lay out some cash four bucks five yeah. bucks in cash and so i to me it fixes so the i see just i see two problems with it it fixes a lot of problems i see two problems with it that is just like it's hard i can't really overcome it one is that you know, some people, while at the end of the day, it might be the same amount of money that you would spend than if you tipped mm -hmm. it. Some people might go, oh my God, these guys have a $20 burger rather than a, you know, $16 burger. Yes, I'm not going to go there, which is fine. Maybe you don't want those people there. And, and, and that's kind of a decision that an owner has to, has to, you know, come to terms with and decide if they want to do that. The other one about it is, uh, you might run into that issue again where staff might go, oh, you know what? We're not like, yes, we're only getting 20%, but I'm not really, I'm, I don't feel valued here necessarily. I can go somewhere else and make more money, which you might always run into right. anyway. It's true, because actually as you could make more than 20% on average, you can, yeah, with, with the other way of tipping, you can make way more than 20% on average. But so yeah, there is no perfect, perfect Especially solution. in craft cocktail. The, the one especially like in a craft cocktail right. bar where I, I've worked and I've made, I've made much more than 20% on, on a shift. Like I used to, a, a couple of places we used to average like 29, 30 a night on the weekend. So like, you know, that's pretty great. Um, but I think that, that it, there it's, there's never going to be a perfect solution. One that I'm actually very fascinated about hearing your opinion on is what you think about profit sharing. Like if an owner was like, cool, rather than trying to, you know, really uproot the mm -hmm. system, because the system has been in place for so long. What if instead of, you know, saying we're going to do a 20% surcharge or anything like that, what if they just said, hey, everybody who works here for, you know, 10 out of the 12 months this year will get a piece of the profit that the, that the business makes at the end of the year as a way to like make up for um, the inequality between back of house and front of house and to maybe make it a little bit more equitable. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think there are many owners that get into the restaurant business and are willing to do that. You know, I think that, I think no. that, that a lot of people get into the restaurant industry for the wrong reason. You know, there are a lot of people that get into the restaurant industry because they look at it as a profitable business model, which I don't see how anybody that knows anything about money or the restaurant industry could ever have those illusions. But they look at people <laughs> like celebrity chefs like Gordon nope. Ramsay or Wolfgang Puck, who, who have made, you know, yeah. 100, 200, 300 million dollar empires off of their off of their, you know, you know, restaurants and, you know, culinary skills. People look at that. They, they see like this is a way to make profit. And so, you know, I mean, that's why a lot of restaurants fail, because you have like money people that are in it for the profit. Uh, yeah. I think that's yeah. a, I think that profit sharing is a great idea if as long as as an owner, you're willing to do that. And the question is, like, how much of the profit are they going to share in? You know, like, for instance, if the profit right. sharing at the end of the year, this bonus at the end of the year doesn't equate to 25 or 30 percent, you know, like, you know, in tips or whatever, it, then then it's like it's like it's like a great it's a great thing to say that you do. It's great for optics, but you're, but the staff might say, well, this isn't worth it. Like I can still just go somewhere else and make more money. You know? Right. I think that like yeah. whatever changes need to be made, I think need to be made industry wide so that there is no like, oh, well, I'm just going to go mm. to this other place and, you know, do this other thing because they do things differently. I think it needs to be like an, like just like tipping is an industry standard. 
you know, like non tipping yeah. would have to be an industry wide decision. Like we're not going to do this anymore. But the problem with that is that right. the people who get tipped do not want to see the end of the tipping thing. People, no, yeah, the people who are actually no. the, 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 the people who this would affect do not want to see the end of tipping, which is, is funny, you know? Right. And, and, and yeah, like, I don't know, like it would feel terrible when I made bad money, but it would feel great when I had made really great money, you know? And it's, a, it's an unsustainable way yeah. of life in a lot of ways because it's, it's so up and down. There's no stability in it whatsoever, you know? And like your whole restaurant, like if you could be working at a restaurant for a long time, that makes a lot of money, lots of regulars, you're making a ton of money there. And then I don't know, the owner sees the, like all this money rolling in and this popularity and start making, it starts making some arbitrary decisions and start changing things. And then all of a sudden, no more money. You don't work at a profitable bar anymore. Yeah. And then you had to go find another job. Right. And it, yeah. <laughs> and I think that maybe this might be a good place to kind of end it. Unfortunately, like it's, it's tough because I think that at least I'd like to think that we illustrated a lot of the nuance in this because I don't think enough people really contemplate like, oh, okay, cool. Get rid of tipping and call it a day. But it's like, it's not that simple. You know, it's, it's, it's something that requires a lot more analysis and trying to figure out something that would really work. And, and I think what we're trying to say is we don't have the right solution. Even me as someone who is in this space, like who's, who has staff and who I have my, my staff that I pay every week. It's like, I've been struggling to find a way to make it more equitable, yeah. and, you know? And so it's, and because, you know, just building on the idea that we don't have the answers. I'd like to put it to you guys, the audience, to tell us what you guys think about this. What do you think about what we said? Absolutely. Do you guys have any other ideas? You know, quite honestly, when I look into YouTube comments on The Educated Barfly, I see people with a ton of great ideas. So what do you guys think about tipping? Is it equitable? Is it not equitable? Should we have it? Is it a good system? Is it a bad system? Just let us know. And, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we you get have some an comments. alternative. We can, we can read it off in the next episode. You know, have a little mini discussion. Yep, absolutely. I love it. All right, guys. Well, I guess that's Louie and myself, your intrepid co-host, Leandro, signing off. Yeah, I don't know. Live long and prosper. Have a good afternoon, morning or night or whenever you're watching this. And we'll see you guys later.